an entire world is ready for you to start your career teaching the path to wellness. Mastering the science of mindfulness and the art of coaching to help clients achieve mental, emotional, and physical betterment of life through movement, nutrition, recovery, and regeneration. Because impacting one person impacts a family. Impacting a family impacts a community. And impacting a community impacts the world. Become an NASM Certified Wellness Coach. You are listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and I just got back from uh, a family getaway to go see family. My kids were off for a week from school, so I was able to get out and get away. But uh, what we did is go see some family because one of my sons was sick over the holidays. And we basically took this time off to go do the trip that we couldn't do over the holidays. So we spent some time in Cincinnati, where my wife's family is from. And we stayed at the Great Wolf Lodge and did an indoor water park. And then we went skiing one day and a, on a mountain that's completely made of fake snow. But it did the job. It did the job well. What we didn't do well was a look at the weather conditions. And uh, so we skied in the rain. We skied in the rain. Um, I'm glad I'm back. <laughs> and I'm happy to be back. It's good to take a little break and to get away. But I don't know. Sometimes it just makes me appreciate work and what I do for work and the gig that I have and the opportunity that I have to go to work every day and work one-on-one -on -one with people and to train people. And, and, and of course, put together content and provide podcasts, which, uh, which is really nice. And I'm glad I'm back with you. So thank you. Thank you for listening. And let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. So getting into this, today we're going to talk about components of a workout. And if you think about it, your workout is comprised of certain components. There are things that you do within a workout. So what things do you do? As a general rule, NASM has a, um, a list of things that they like to do. And it's, it's in order. It tends to go this way. Ready? There are six components of a workout. And within each component has more stuff, but this is kind of like the overview, all right? So we're going to start number one with a warm up. And then, and let's just go through all of them. Let's go through the components and then we'll chat about them. So there's a warm up, and then core, balance, plyometrics, resistance training, and then a cool down. All right, so let's go through it again. There's warm up, core, balance, plyometrics. There is the optional SAQ. SAQ stands for speed, agility, and quickness. So you can do speed, agility, and quickness within that as well. And that's optional because not everybody, you're not going to have every client do ladder drills. You're not going to have every client do T drills or shark skill tests. So that may not be there, just different types of running drills. So speed, agility, quickness may or may not be involved in it. But after that, so warm-up, core, balance, plyometrics, SAQ as an option, resistance training, and then cool down. But let's talk about the warm-up first. So let's go to the warm-up. And within the warm-up, there are kind of two major components or sub-components within the warm-up. There is flexibility. And there is cardio. And I would also say that under the flexibility um, component, you might also put mobility. So flexibility and mobility. Flexibility is the soft tissue extensibility and your ability to move through ranges of motion. The mobility is the specific uh, ability of a joint to go through a range of motion. So they're not always the same. And maybe we can have another conversation, another point about the differences between flexibility and mobility. But it's an opportunity to increase range of motion. 
and to prep the body, to warm up the body. And there are multiple different types of flexibility. If you look through the catalog of what it is that we like to do, there's the option of self-myofascial release as a form of flexibility. There is static stretching. There is active stretching. There is dynamic stretching. All of those are forms of flexibility. So those can be included. Just depends on what phase you're in and what your goal is for your clients. So if you're working with a client and they you see that they're really tight, they have some really tight musculature, then doing some SMR, doing some static stretching, doing some mobility drills, that might be very important. If you've got people that their range of motion is fine and their workout is going to be more dynamic, then doing more of an active and dynamic functional flexibility workout, preparing them for their more dynamic exercises that'll be coming down the pipe, then that's what you'd like to take on. Then you also have another component within there. So you've got the warm up has flexibility and then it also has cardio. And the cardio component, it we put it in the warm up because it's good to help you warm up. But I like to also add it throughout and it just depends on where we are and what we're doing adding cardio sometimes and oftentimes throughout the workout. So I might run a circuit and I might do at the end of a circuit uh, a cardio exercise. So within the warm up, I'm not blasting them necessarily. Uh, and it doesn't mean that I don't. Sometimes even in the warm up, the very first thing that we get doing, I might put somebody on the airdyne bike or the ski erg and say, all right, let's go 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, high intensity for 30, and then bring it down for 30. Now that amps them up pretty quickly, but that's only after I've done a nice flexibility prep with them. And I go through some mobility drills and I do warm up drills for their hips and then I throw them into the cardio. And that's good, but then I might do that circuit, right? So I might, in my resistance training, go through a circuit, tag a cardio component at the end of it. So I might do that same thing. Let's just say 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. So maybe I do a circuit like today. I was doing a leg circuit with somebody and then throw a little piece of cardio in at the end. So what it was, was um, a barbell reverse lunge on one leg and then the other leg reverse lunge. So uh, 10 repetitions on each. And then I did a rear foot elevated lunge, 10 on each leg. And then I had them go back to the squat bar, the barbell, and do squats with uh, the same weight they did the lunges. Well, it's not heavy for them to do squats with, but at the end of doing the reverse lunges and the rear foot elevated lunges to actually come back and do squats, uh, gassed. He was very gassed. This is a, an endurance um, focus that I put him through. And then at the end of it, let's throw him on a bike and get him going 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. For 30 seconds on, it's basically so only did one round. So 30 seconds, high intensity, and then take a break. Up to two minutes, take a break before we cycle back through again. I like to try to keep it at a minute. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll put somebody in, their first circuit will be a minute, and then their second time through between their second and third set will be two minutes just so they have more time to recover because they've increased the volume of work that they've actually done. So I add the I add the cardio in throughout the workout, depending on the client. This client is preparing for rugby, getting ready for rugby season, and I'm just trying to, to get him prepared in the ways that I see fit. That's just one of his circuits. Uh, and this isn't about him. This is just an example of where you can put cardio in. Well, I also have... Now going from the warm up, and we've got within the warm up flexibility and cardio, uh, and then flexibility has multiple different things underneath it. So we've got uh, SMR, static, active, dynamic, and mobility. They kind of have the same thing for cardio, right? Like not all cardio is what I just did, which are 30 seconds um, working really hard at high intensity. There are different types of interval trainings. There are different intensities in high intensity training. There is sprint interval training, which is about a one to eight to a one to 12 work to rest ratio. And that would be going all out for 10 seconds, as fast, as hard as you can, and then having an 80 second break. 
Now, what that does, it's not designed necessarily to gas you if you're only doing, uh, you know, 10 seconds, um, but it will. The, the thing about that is that you're working on your speed and how fast you can produce those forces. So if you're working on increasing speed of rate production and your cardio and what you're trying to do, then that could be running, that could be rowing, it doesn't matter, on the bike. But if you practice too long, right? Like you practice these longer things. If your your goal is to get faster in the short term and all you're doing is practicing really hard for longer periods of time, you're just practicing getting exhausted versus the practice of getting faster and then recovering from that and practicing getting faster. So there are options with your cardio. It could be sprint interval training, high intensity interval training, long, slow duration training. Uh, you can do... Um, uh, the fart like training or what's called that uh, speed play, which is just kind of make it up as you go, which is, you know, go fast for 10 seconds, relax right here, uh, speed it up again. And you're just kind of making it up as you go. And it's called speed play, which means just have fun with it. Have fun with it. You move from that section then from doing the flexibility and the cardio in the warm up or outside of the warm up, and you move into core. And the core is the lumbo-pelvic hip complex. It's basically if you unplug your arms and your legs, then you're left with your core. It's also any muscle that crosses over the lumbo-pelvic hip complex is considered to be core musculature as well. So there are a lot of muscles that are part of the core. And within the core in the OPT model, we have stabilization, strength, and power. So a core stabilization exercise would be little to no movement of your lumbopelvic hip complex while working the muscles within the core. Those would be exercises like um, planks, like um, heel taps, floor bridges, floor cobras. So you're not moving the lumbopelvic hip complex, you're keeping stable, but you're working the muscles around it. You can work the muscles of the core. Anti-rotational exercises would be a good example. Um, anything that you're not moving the core, but you're working the core. It's a great example of core stability. And then you can move on into core strength and core strength would be exercising the core. That'd like Roman chair machines, side bends, crunches, rotational core exercises. And then there's the core power, which would be explosive exercises. So uh, a lot of times we talk about explosive exercises and includes throwing something. And this is where medicine balls come in really handy and making sure you have the right medicine ball for what you're trying to do. So to make sure that, you know, if you're going to slam a ball down, that it's not a bouncy medicine ball that comes back up and smacks you in the grill. It's going to be one of maybe those sand medicine balls. When you throw it down and it hits the ground, it stays there and you are safe. You're going to use the right tool for the job. And being a fitness professional and working at facilities, you should try to ensure that you have all the right things for the jobs that you're doing. That's core. Core stability, core strength, core power. And there's balance. So you can move into the balance component. So we've done warm up and core. The balance component. Balance could be very similar, right, to the core exercises. I'm going to stand on a single leg, and I'm going to practice not moving my stance leg. So I can move my arms. I can move my other leg. I can move my pelvis on top of my stance leg, but my stance leg stays stable. That is a balance stabilization exercise. And then if you move to balance strength, balance strength is basically any strength training exercise that you would do on two legs, just done on one leg. So a squat, be a single leg squat, a deadlift, single leg deadlift, an RDL, single leg RDL, a step up would be a step up to balance, a lunge, forward lunge, reverse lunge, side lunge, it would all be forward lunge to balance, side lunge to balance, reverse lunge to balance, because it is a balance training exercise. And then in your plyometrics, it would be a hop from one leg to another leg. 
So as you start to progress and you're starting to do balance exercise, it's going to be a hop from one leg to the other leg, but then you're going to hold it when you land. You're going to stabilize your hold. When you touch down, you land hopping from your right leg, landing on your left leg. A hop, a hop is a single leg jump. A jump is with two legs. A hop is with one leg. I think it might be a bound technically because a bound is from one leg to the other leg. So you bound sideways and you balance, you stabilize, you hold it three to five seconds, make sure that they're stabilizing. Because what happens a lot is that if people hop over to one side and then they start to fall slowly back to the other side and then they jump. Don't let them cheat out of that. Yeah, I would rather you put your foot down, get your balance, stabilize yourself, and then hop over to the next one instead of just falling back into it. Let me take balance. Plyometrics. Plyometrics. You can go into your plyos. Plyometrics. Uh, the first phase of plyometrics stabilization we call reactive, uh, which is you're not focusing so much on the jump, but focusing on your landing mechanics. Landing softly, ball to heel, controlling your landing, absorbing those forces, and then pausing. So you let's call it squat jump to uh, squat jump. And when you go down into your squat, you're going to hold it in that bottom position for three to five seconds. And that three to five seconds, you can check your feet alignment, make sure they're straight ahead, make sure your knees are in line with your second and third toes. And then you can jump and land again. Hold it three to five seconds. So 10 repetitions can be 30 to 50 seconds. And it is challenging. Some of the best athletes that I've worked with are tapping out doing these squat jumps to hold. And I also work with them and focus on absorbing those landing mechanics. When they land, land softly. You are a ninja training camp and loud ninjas don't get work, All right? So you gotta land softly. And usually when you start talking about things in terms of ninjas, people are like, oh, I'm in. Okay, well, let's let's do it. So I have excellent response with the ninja game. Well, now you move up to speed up speed strength to plyometric strength, and that's just repeating jumps. It's repeating jumps. You're not going as fast as you can, but you're just repeating, jumping, landing, jumping, landing. So now you're starting to focus more on the concentric phase on the jump. We've been focusing on the landing. Now we're focusing on the jump. And then we get to the power phase of our plyometrics. And then we start to really accelerate things, minimizing what's called the amateurization phase, which is the phase between when we touch the ground and when we leave the ground. So now we're trying to spend less time on the ground and exert more force in the jump. We're not going to spend much time talking about speed, agility, and quickness. The SAQ, that is optional. But oh, we could do clearly an entire podcast on a single section of speed and then another one on agility and another on quickness. Usually put them all together. Maybe we'll have a conversation about this at another time. But we shall move on to resistance. The next phase we've done warm up, core, balance, plyometrics, SAQ, kind of skirted over as an option. And then to our resistance training, resistance training is uh, any type of resistance. It could be body weight training. It could be external weights like dumbbells and barbells and kettlebells and bells. Just bell, any bell, any bell. Bells. And then bands, tubing, these elastic resistance. Great. There's great research that shows benefit from elastic resistance. Don't just think because it's elastic that you don't get the uh, results that you would otherwise get. You get great results from elastics. The difference is how hard are you pushing yourself with elastics? Are you getting uh, enough weight? Are you, are you lifting enough weight in order to do it? And sometimes elastics can be hard to control, but it's really fantastic for Stability training, uh, other, uh, suspension, 
suspension was the other thing I wanted to mention. There are a lot of suspension trainers out there and TRX is kind of the name brand in the space. So if I say suspension trainer and you don't know what I'm talking about and I say TRX and you go, ah, that's what we're talking about. There are a lot of brands in the space out there. Uh, TRX would be the, the leader, the one that, you know, but suspension training is another fantastic means of doing exercise. And also, you know, we did mention body weight and I think body weight should be included in there because there's so many of us doing virtual training and we're working with people that don't have stuff. Well, I would, if I were to send links to mini loops and to power bands and to handled bands and suspension trainers and see if they can buy some of that stuff because that stuff is fantastic. It can be used and it just gives you more to work with because sometimes body weight can be really challenging. Sometimes body weight is too much for people to do. Sometimes body weight is not enough for people to do what you want to do with them. So the external resistance, whether it's free weights or bands or suspension trainers, that they're all great opportunities. And then we've got stabilization, strength, and power. We've got slow controlled movement for high repetitions followed by moderate tempo movements and strength for moderate repetitions like a 6 to 12 range. And then there's a max strength, 1 to, one to 5 repetitions. So it's really heavy. And so you may have a hard time doing some of these other phases with body weight or with bands. So that external resistance, like the free weights come in more handy as you start to progress. And then you kind of ramp back up to the power phase and then you start moving lighter things incredibly fast. You start focusing on explosiveness. All of these are pieces of resistance training. And then there are the superset phases, the strength endurance training and the power phase five training. And then as you go into your PES, you can move into and then the next phase after that, which is kind of just performance-based training, all part uh, included in resistance training. And then you move into your cool down. What's your cool down? Same thing as your warm up, really. It can have flexibility components in it. It can have cardio components in it. Uh, it just depends on what it is you're looking to do. Now, I always do cardio components at the end for my cool down, but I don't always do Sorry, I always do flexibility components at the end for my cool down. So I work with people. If I'm training them, I'll oftentimes do partner assisted stretching. It's kind of like the dessert at the end of a meal. All right. It's the it's the feel good bits that I can do flexibility with them that I know is going to be beneficial. And then they don't have to do anything. Finally, they they don't have to do anything. And then I have some other people. For efficacy's sake, self-efficacy, I work with them and I talk them through or do the stretches alongside them. And that's a cheat for me because I'm teaching them how to do the stretch or working with them through the stretches. And then I get to do the stretches too, which is good for my body and good for my well-being. And there are cardio components that you can do. Some people will say, okay, let's do like a three-minute ski erg cool down. This is how we're going to wrap up our workout. There are some people that do cardio component, they'll do finishers. So at the end of a workout, it's it's not a cool down, it is a high intensity uh, finish you off at the end of a workout and now you're exhausted. Uh, and that's great, I'm, I'm a fan of that too. And then the cool down might simply be uh, a nice set of flow stretches or partner assisted stretches. But those are the components of a workout, warm up. Core, balance, plyometrics, SAQ, and then resistance and a cool down. One more time. Core. Oh, sorry. Warm up. Core, balance, plyometrics, SAQ, resistance, and cool down. These are the components of the workout. I implement almost all of these in every single one of my workouts. Sometimes I shift and I may not do plyometrics, but warm up, core, balance, resistance, and cool down every single time, pretty much for every single person. And then the plyometrics get added in there, probably a far more than SAQ. And then SAQ as it fits. And it also sometimes 
is something I want to do, but the gym is too busy for me to do it. So there, there are components that allow me to be able to do things. And it's everything's also based on the environment. It's based on the individual and it's based on the task and what we want them to do. All right. Uh, listen, if you've got questions about what I've talked about, please feel free to ask them. I'd love to answer any questions you may have. You can reach out to me on Instagram at dr.rickritchie, or you can email me at rick.ritchie, R-I-C-H-E-Y, at nasm.org. Thank you so much for listening. Like, subscribe, and share it with your fellow fitness professionals. It'd be much appreciated. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.